Hi everybody, welcome to this virtual program brought to you by Whitefish Legacy Partners. We not only manage the Whitefish Trail, but we work with tons of partners in our community to keep our forests uh, enjoyable for you. My name is Christiane and I'm the Education Coordinator. And today I've invited some very important people from our community who know all about what's going on. Today we are at the Beaver Lakes Trail area on the Stillwater State Forest. And when you're out here recreating, you might notice some logging projects going on. So today we're going to take a closer look and learn all about what's going on on the trail. Hello, my name is Dave Ring. I'm the unit manager for the Stillwater State Forest. It encompasses both the Stillwater State Forest north of Whitefish and the Coal Creek State Forest in the uh, North Fork River drainage. We are at the south end of the Stillwater State Forest in the Beaver Lake area. Yeah, this is a um, area that's really close to Whitefish, has, received, has always received a lot of uh, recreational use, but it's also had a long history of forest management also. Um, Interestingly enough, too, some of the 1910 fire actually occurred in this area at, at the time. It was a significant event for um, firefighting and forest management. I'm Margosha Jadkowski. I'm the Director of Lands and Partnerships for Whitefish Legacy Partners. We're out here um, in the Beaver Lakes area, which is an area that's been protected for future generations by the City of Whitefish and Whitefish Legacy Partners with a public recreation use easement. So what that means is that the development rights have been removed from this lands to ensure that they'll stay as open lands. When Whitefish Legacy Partners and the city um, first began putting this area under conservation with a public recreation use easement, um, it was because this area had been identified as being really important to the community for a lot of different reasons. You know, one for recreation and public access, this is an area that the community has loved recreating in for um, generations and we want to make sure that that um, is open to future generations as well. So um, we paid over seven million dollars into the state trust to those beneficiaries to make sure that these lands would remain open for public recreation, public access, um, as well as all the conservation values like wildlife habitat protection, watershed protection, um, and working forest. This is a model of conservation um, that works really well on lands like this, like on our state trust lands, that allows for multiple uses. Um, and under this model of conservation, we can um, both have managed recreation, like with the Whitefish Trail, as well as dispersed recreation, like hunting, fishing, huckleberry picking, um, be kind of layered over other uses on the landscape, like the active forest management that's happening out here. Recreation is an important use um, around the whitefish area, and this area has been used heavily um, up to before the recre recreational use easement was in place. It's helped provide us some structure to how recreation gets um, done on out here. It's provided better management of um, uses and making sure that in vandal vandalism and um, those sorts of things have definitely decreased since we've had the trail system out here. So these, these lands um, are state trust lands, which were um, given to the state by the federal government when Montana became a state in 1889. This is part of a plan that actually Thomas Jefferson put together in regards to enabling states to educate their people. So the lands were given to the states to then decide whether to um, use them for agriculture, for commercial value, or sell them off. And so the, the state received two sections in every township in Montana. Um, over time, those have been moved around, but um, they are for the benefit of K through 12 education, um, the university system, uh, deaf and blind school in Great Falls, um, a youth school in Miles City, and some other trusts that benefit from um, state trust lands. Um, so the, the revenue that we generate from here, so if we generate $100,000, a million dollars from this timber sale, majority of that, um, those receipts goes to the to the schools goes to k-12 through education goes to montana tech goes to the university of montana 
So it's kind of a really neat um, mission that we have is to manage the forest and then also provide for the education system for the state of Montana. The Beaver Lake 2020 timber sale, it, its, current, its current progress, we're about 50% completed. The loggers plan to move in here in the next week and um, start working on it again. I'm sure their intent would be to finish it this um, winter, fall, winter, but um, conditions and other factors will weigh in on that. They still have another year after this to um, complete this timber sale. The timber sale is located <laughs> near Beaver Lake and Murray Lake. It starts at the south end there by Murray Lake and then stretches to the north and west over several different areas, mimicking again what we would think a natural disturbance would be. This sale was approximately two, two and a half million board feet in size. So when the DNRC approached us a few years ago to let us know that they were planning a timber sale here, there were lots of considerations that went into um, how we were gonna work with them on the planning of the sale. And from our kind of end of things, thinking about public access and recreation, as well as all the conservation values that were protected by the public recreation use easement here. We wanted to make sure that um, while the forests were being managed to be healthy, um, to generate revenue for the school trusts and to help protect our community from wildfire, we're also protecting um, public access here, the recreation experience, um, that, you know, folks will have while they're out on the trail. So this timber sale was the first timber sale that um, we worked with our partners at Whitefish Legacy Partners and the City of Whitefish on it within the easement that they purchased, um, the recreation use easement they purchased a while back. Um, within that e document is kind of some guideline or some structure on how we um, figure out how to perform forest management within the easement area and um, while minimizing um, impacts to users and to um, while still providing revenue to the trust. Um, what that worked out to be here was several meetings both in the field and um, meeting inside to kind of work through what was important to each group um, trying to figure out um, could designs be done to um, mitigate those results and some of those were um, as mentioning that this had leaf trees in it we placed some of our we moved our leaf trees around a little bit more near the trail to reduce kind of create a feathering effect with the, the trail we did some timing restrictions as far as um, the logging wouldn't start till after Labor Day so you know, the big push on the trail was um, over. One of the objectives of our timber sale is to mimic natural disturbance, whether a wind event or fire or some uh, event like that. Um, of course, within those bounds, we have um, wildlife issues that we're um, cognizant of as far as um, endangered species like lynx, grizzly bear, west cutthroat trout, um, you know, how they move through the unit, how the elk and the deer move through the unit. Um, there's also a bunch of bird species that, you know, we try to make sure that our management doesn't impact them in any way and try to design the units, design the sale so the impact is minimal. Um, our typical sales are three years long. The logger has that long to adjust to the markets, get the project done, once he's completed, then we'll come back in, do site prep if it's necessary, mechanically disturb the ground um, to encourage the seeds to drop and then get germination that way, or we'll come back and plant trees. Um, again, because we're a trust beneficiary, it's very important that we get the next crop of trees growing. So we're not just, you shouldn't just see a vacant field. You should, you always see trees growing back up on state trust land. The prescription for this unit was a sea tree which um, typically for the still water is six to, we leave six to eight trees per acre, which ranges from 
60 to 100 feet, kind of depending. And when we call a seed tree, we're leaving what we we're leaving what we think is the best genetic um, parent tree out there. So we're looking for the best species to propagate the next species um, using natural regeneration. Um, so this tree to my right is uh, a tree that was spe specifically picked by a forester as we are walking through, through this unit. Um, again, what we're looking to leave is the best genetics for future generations. So the seeds that come off this tree will fall on the ground and, and produce that next generation of trees. This area, the trees that are left are a good example of, of kind of the, some of the thought choices that um, a forester goes through as they progress to decide which tree to leave. Um, these ones further up right here, you can tell they're, they have a pretty full crown, um, about halfway down their stem, um, real nice pointed top, healthy, vigorous trees that, you know, they have another 100 years at least. Um, in them before old age will catch up with them. Where here you can see some trees that are older, greater than 200 years old, and you can see there's no, um, the crown is very sparse, um, the top is kind of rounded, and the, it's the, the crown is, you know, around 30% of the total length of the stem. Um, so the tree is just old and starting to um, fade out as we all do over time. Um, this area is, it had a lot of, um, again, the um, subalpine fir, grand fir, and um, dug fir. And so a lot of that's been removed, as you can tell, and mostly what we've left is just the pure large stand. The, um, so this particular unit that got harvested, once it, once the unit is completely harvested, we will be looking at, um, performing site prep if it's needed. Um, that can be mechanical. Um, we can use fire at times, but I'm, that's not gonna be our plan here. You'll notice too, nearby this location, there's several um, slash piles. We are trying to work on a contract right now to have those ground up and um, used as fuel um, for this winter for various businesses that use um, wood chips. So um, that's another option we're pursuing. We expect this unit to have, um, will be regenerated within five to seven years. If we have natural regeneration is our typical plan, but if we're going to plant it, we'll do it within that time frame. Again, with species that um, are more fire resistant, drought resistant, and disease and bug resistant, which are more typically your larch and your pea pine and uh, dug fir does pretty good too, but uh, it's more, a little more susceptible. I'm Summer Kemp Jennings. I'm the fire ecologist for Glacier National Park. I would describe fire ecology as the, the interaction between fire and our landscape, um, particularly for me, fire and vegetation on the landscape. A lot of times um, fire ecology is looking at um, the different species on the landscape and um, the fuels on the landscape. So um, how different species are um, adapted to fire um, and um, how resilient different species are to fire. So a great example um, here is Western Larch. So Western Larch is the most fire um, resilient species in the Northern Rockies. Um, so Western Larch has really thick bark so um, that, that heat that comes from fire, um, western larch tend to be you know, more protected from that heat than other species. Um, they have a relatively um, high crown, so um, the fire you know, isn't, isn't able to like, catch and carry up through the trees as easily. Um, they, western larch are also, um, you know, it grows kind of straight and really tall. And then the seeds um, are dispersed really far by wind. And um, they do really well in bare mineral soil um, in direct sunlight. So basically if a fire does move through, not only are western larch uh, more able to survive that fire, but then they're quite poised to, um, 
regenerate in that burned area. So the, you know, the height of the tree provides kind of just like this good position for its wind dispersed seeds to carry far distances into the burn scar and then um, germinate in that open bare mineral soil. So if we're talking about um, fire res resilience, it's definitely a spectrum. So our most fire resilient species in this area are gonna be our larch and our ponderosa pine. Um, a, a little less so, but still fire resistant. We have things like dug fir, and then um, our least fire resistant species are gonna be um, spruce and grand fir. Some other characteristics in the forest that are gonna impact um, how fire move, moves through are um, gonna be things like um, density. So just um, how tightly packed the forest is with trees. Um, also kind of if you think about the vertical fuel profile, so we hear things like ladder fuels. So if, if we have um, fuel that goes, you know, from the forest floor, so you can think about like shrubs and small trees, you know, and then slightly bigger trees and slightly bigger trees, um, and then our overstory trees, if a fire moves through there, it's going to carry, you know, from the ground up that ladder of fuels into um, potentially the crown of the overstory trees. Um, another important consideration is just the, um, the pattern on the landscape. So if you have um, fairly similar, tightly packed forest of um, you know, similar characteristics and similar size and age class, um, a fire is potentially going to uniformly move through that landscape where if you have kind of a matrix of um, different age classes and different fuel structures on that landscape, maybe some openings, um, those openings are gonna act to maybe slow the spread of the fire um, and just alter the um, overall um, characteristics of how the fire is gonna move through the landscape and also um, how the landscape is gonna respond after that fire. We can use active forest management as a tool for um, emulating natural disturbances. So for example, um, if we look around us in the area that was logged, you know, we mostly have um, standing, mature, overstory, larch species, um, which is probably what would be left if a fire had moved through this landscape. Um, another you know, important consideration is that patchiness on the landscape. So we can use um, active management to create some of those um, openings on the landscape um, through, you know, in this case, um, a seed tree uh, logging operation where, you know, the, um, a lot of the ladder fuels were removed here and, um, the overstory fuels were thinned, so it really changes the, the composition of, of the fuel structure throughout this landscape. And the hope there is that um, if a fire were to occur, um, this area would um, be, be a spot that would slow the spread of that fire or potentially be a good spot to um, fight that fire. So a lot of times we use the term defensible space. So this could potentially be an area um, that could be, you know, used for um, fighting a fire um, and defensible space for the surrounding communities. Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, along with our partners with the Forest Service and the Park Service in this part of Montana and our local government entities coordinate to um, protect wildland fire from these lands. Um, this particular area is covered by the Stillwater Unit. In our forest protection, we have two, uh, two fire engines that we use to patrol this area during the summertime to um, prevent any wildfires. The one of the, this area is also part of the Community Wildfire Protection Plan and um, it's also part, parts of this 
are within the um, wildland urban face of Whitefish or in, in this part of the county. So we were, that's also part of our, what one of our objectives would be too, is just trying to, with good forest management, you create better opportunities to prevent fire and manage fire when it happens. So one of the things we were, one of the things we look at is our types of harvest and where they're located in relation to our adjacent neighbors. Um, this area is near the railroad and um, Highway 93, both which can generate um, potential sparks. So if a fire is moving, a big fire is moving, it, the hope would be that we've opened ours up enough that it'll kind of stop a fire or, or provide opportunities to, to fight it safely with our firefighters. Within our Northwest Montana landscape, we have, you know, many jurisdictions. So we have um, Forest Service, we have the National Park Service, we have state and um, private, uh, county, all these different um, land ownerships that kind of make up this matrix within Northwest Montana. Um, but if you zoom out, you know, most, most of Northwest Montana is forested and that forest really kind of runs from one jurisdiction into the other. So um, even if this is, you know, state trust land, um, it really impacts, you know, it's impacted by what's next to it and it also impacts what's next to it. So it's important to think about, you know, forest management across the whole landscape in Northwest Montana. So even though different, different land management agencies have um, different mandates and different objectives, um, it's really important to, to consider them as basically pieces of the puzzle for um, Northwest Montana. The patchwork of different land management agencies in Northwest Montana are all kind of like pieces of a puzzle that kind of make up the, the overall um, forests of Northwest Montana and um, really how, how those forests are going to um, respond to fire and um, how those fires are going to move through our forests. Because when a fire comes, you know, it doesn't, the fire doesn't care like where those lines are. One thing that's important to um, know and remember is that um, on public lands, we're, we're managing for multiple uses. So um, here we have uh, some of the, you know, heavy recreation uses are something that's managed for. Um, we also have the um, revenue production for um, the, the beneficiaries of the state trust land. Um, wildlife is a consideration. And then, um, you know, fire safe communities is also a consideration. I think one of the important takeaways with forest management and um, recreation and, and use by the public is just remembering how, how they're all interconnected and how they're important to one another. Um, with forest management, we're creating revenue, which then goes back into um, the school trusts that benefits them. In the process, we're also mitigating for fuel loads while also um, creating and uh, creating and managing for wildlife habitat to make sure that exists continues to exist on the landscape for future generations. So really, anytime a recreationist is out here using the forest, they are they are part of that whole process of 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 this forest. One of the goals of the Whitefish Trail is to connect the community to these protected landscapes. So um, while folks are out on the trail, whether they're out for a mountain bike ride or a hike with their family um, or skiing or snowshoeing during the winter, they are having an experience out here on the landscape that helps them to form their own personal relationship with that landscape. And we believe that that creates um, new and stronger advocates for conservation. And it also helps um, the community to understand what's happening on these landscapes. So whether it's kind of natural phenomenon like windstorms um, or fires, 
or management that goes into them. So an interesting thing about the Whitefish Trail is that while you're out at different areas, um, you're actually going through forests that have been managed in different ways and on different timelines. So maybe you go to Lion Mountain and you um, are going through a forest that was managed um, or that was logged, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and you can see how it's regenerating. You can see what kind of state it's in. Um, out here in the Beaver Lakes area, there are areas of forest that have been managed more recently. And then with the Beaver to Boil timber sale that's going on now, you can see kind of what it looks like. So it helps people to form what that timeline um, of forest regeneration after a, a management looks like um, and to understand, you know, what are some of the impacts of that management. One of the benefits of this partnership with Legacy Partners and the City of Whitefish has just been working with them and um, getting them to better understand forest management so then they can share that with the people that they interact on a regular basis. Um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions with forestry and, and why we do some things and, and it works on such a longer time scale than um, most people think about. So I think that makes it hard to kind of grasp at times. So we're really grateful for all the partnerships that have come together in an area like Beaver Lakes, um, both with the DNRC, with the Stillwater State Forest, with the City of Whitefish. Um, with fish, wildlife, and parks, with, with all these different partners who have been involved in this area um, in managing and protecting it. And we're so grateful that we have the kind of relationships we do with those partners where when a project like this timber sale comes up, we can all come together, um, kind of come around the table, look at, at what everybody's different priorities and goals are and then collaborate to um, make sure that the outcome is is what's going to serve everybody serve the landscape and serve the community thank you so much for joining us today for this program i definitely learned a lot about the management of our forest i want to say thank you to all the folks that helped us today to learn and i want to thank you for supporting the whitefish trail system and whitefish legacy partners if you'd like to learn more, please visit www.whitefishlegacy.org. We've got a whole library of virtual programs to learn from, but also if you'd like to get involved and contribute and help out, we're always welcoming. Thank you so much. Have a great day.